part one chapters one and two of the mysteries of marseilles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli part one chapter one how blanche de casalis eloped with philippe Cayolle. towards the end of the month of may eighteen four blank a man about thirty years of age was walking rapidly along a footpath in the st joseph quarter near the aguelade he had left his horse in the care of a small cultivator occupying a neighbouring farm and was going in the direction of a large solidly built square house a kind of country chateau such as are to be found on the hills of provence the man turned aside to avoid the chateau and went and seated himself in a pine wood which spread out behind the building then anxious and feverish he pushed aside the branches and glanced along the pathways apparently awaiting some one with impatience now and again he rose and took a few steps then reseated himself all in a tremble this man who was tall and of strange appearance wore bushy black whiskers his long face marked by energetic lineaments displayed a kind of violent and passionate beauty suddenly his eyes softened and a tender smile spread over his thick lips a young girl had just issued from the chateau and stooping as though to hide herself was hastening towards the pine wood rosy and breathless she reached the shelter of the trees she was barely sixteen years old beneath the blue ribbons of her straw hat her young face was smiling with a joyous and at the same time a startled expression her fair hair fell over her shoulders her little hands pressed to her breast were endeavouring to calm her throbbing heart how late you are blanche said the young man i had almost given up hoping to see you and he seated her on the moss beside him forgive me philippe answered the young girl my uncle has gone to aix to purchase an estate but i could not get rid of my governess she yielded herself to the embrace of him she adored and the two lovers enjoyed one of those long talks which are at once so silly and so sweet blanche was like a big child playing with her lover as she would have done with a doll philippe now ardent and speechless was pressing the young girl to him and gazing upon her with all the transports of love and ambition and whilst they were seated there oblivious of the world they noticed on raising their heads some peasants who were following a neighbouring path whilst watching them and laughing blanche full of alarm drew away from her lover i am lost she exclaimed turning quite pale those men will inform my uncle ah for pity's sake philippe save me the young man jumped up on hearing her cry if you wish me to save you he replied impetuously you must follow me come let us fly together to-morrow your uncle will consent to our marriage and we shall be united for evermore fly fly repeated the child ah i fear i have not the courage to do so i am too weak too timid i will sustain you blanche we will live a life of love blanche without hearing without replying let her head drop on philippe's shoulder oh i dread i dread the convent she resumed after a time in a low voice you will marry me you will love me always i love you see i am on my knees then closing her eyes yielding blanche hastily descended the slope clinging to the arm of philippe who had risen after she had gone some distance she looked back a last time at the home she was leaving and a poignant emotion filled her eyes with tears a minute's error had sufficed to throw her into the young man's arms exhausted and confiding she loved philippe with all the warmth of a first passion with all the folly of her inexperience she was running away like a schoolgirl voluntarily and without weighing the terrible consequences of her flight and philippe was carrying her off intoxicated with his victory and quivering at feeling her moving and panting at his side at first he thought of hastening to marseilles to procure a vehicle but he was afraid to leave her alone on the high road and he preferred to go with her on foot as far as his mother's country house which was situated quite a league away in the st just quarter philippe had to leave his horse behind and the two lovers started off bravely together they passed through meadows ploughed fields and pine woods taking short cuts and walking very quickly it was about four o'clock the sun clear and scorching cast before them broad sheets of light 
and they hastened along in the warm air urged on by the madness which was eating into their hearts as they passed by the labourers raised their heads and watched their flight with amazement it did not take them an hour to reach the home of philippe's mother blanche quite tired out seated herself on a stone bench beside the door whilst the young man went to see if the coast was clear he then returned and conducted her to his room he had begged ayas a gardener whom his mother was employing that day to fetch a vehicle from marseilles both were still a prey to the excitement of their flight whilst awaiting the vehicle they remained silent and anxious philippe having led blanche to a little chair knelt at her feet and gazed lingeringly at her seeking to reassure her by gently kissing the hand she yielded to him you cannot remain in that light gown he said after a time would you like to dress up as a man blanche smiled she felt childlike joy at the thought of disguising herself my brother is rather short continued philippe you can put on some of his things it made them quite merry the young girl dressed herself laughing the while she was charmingly awkward and philippe eagerly kissed the blushes on her cheeks when she was ready she had quite the appearance of a little man of a youngster of twelve she had great difficulty in confining her mass of hair in the hat and her lover's hands trembled as he gathered the rebellious locks together ayas at length returned with the vehicle he consented to receive the fugitives in his own home at st barnabé philippe took what money he possessed and all three entered the carriage which they left at the pont du jarret continuing the journey to the gardener's house on foot it was now twilight transparent shadows were falling from the pale heavens whilst acrid odours rose from the earth still warm with the last rays of the sun then a vague fear took possession of blanche her heart was sinking within her she sought to gain time listen said she to philippe i will write to my confessor abbe chastanier he will go and see my uncle to obtain my pardon and his consent to our marriage i think i should not be so frightened were i your wife philippe smiled at the tender simplicity of the last words write to abbe chastanier he answered for my part i will send my brother our address he will come to-morrow and will take your letter it was thus that blanche de casalis eloped with philippe Cayol one fine may evening ah sweet and terrible night which was doomed to overwhelm the lovers with wretchedness and bring them nothing but suffering and regret for the rest of their lives chapter two introduces the hero marius Cayol. marius Cayol, the brother of blanche's lover was about twenty-five years old he was short thin and puny his light yellow face with its long narrow black eyes was lighted up at times with a kind of smile of self-devotion and resignation he walked with a slight stoop and the hesitation and timidity of a child but the hatred of evil the love of uprightness that filled his being made him appear almost handsome he had assumed the hardships of the family leaving his brother to follow his ambitious and passionate instincts he made himself quite insignificant beside him saying generally that as he was the ugly one he ought not to emerge from his ugliness he added that it was excusable for philippe to like to display his fine figure and the vigorous beauty of his countenance moreover when necessary he could be severe towards the great impetuous child who was a senior and whom he treated with the remonstrances and affection of a father their mother now a widow was not at all wealthy she had a difficulty in making both ends meet on the remnants of her dowry the major portion of which her husband had lost in business this money deposited at a banker's yielded her a small income which had enabled her to bring up her two sons but when they had reached man's estate she showed them her empty hands and placed them face to face with the difficulties of life and the two brothers thrown thus into the struggle for existence led on by their different natures followed diametrically opposite courses philippe who had an appetite for wealth and liberty could not bend himself to labour he wished to attain fortune by the shortest road and had visions of making a rich marriage that was in his idea an excellent expedient a rapid means of obtaining an income and a pretty wife so he passed his life in the sunshine became amorous and even slightly dissipated he experienced an extreme delight in being well dressed in displaying his elegant hasty manners his eccentric garments his love-laden glances and speeches about marseilles his mother and brother who spoiled him endeavoured to provide for his whims 
moreover philippe was acting in good faith he adored women and it seemed natural to him to be beloved and carried off some day by a rich and beautiful young girl of noble birth whilst his brother was exhibiting his fine looks marius had taken a situation as clerk in the office of m martelly a shipowner residing in the rue de la darse he felt quite happy hidden away in his office his sole ambition being to earn a modest competence and to live a peaceful and unostentatious life besides this he felt a secret pleasure in assisting his mother and brother the money he earned was dear to him because he could give it away and bestow happiness with it and himself taste the profound delights of self-sacrifice he had chosen in life the straight way the painful path which leads to peace joy and self-respect the young man was on the point of starting for his office when he received a letter in which his brother informed him of his elopement with mademoiselle de casalis it filled him with painful surprise and he beheld at a glance the frightful chasm into the depths of which the lovers had cast themselves he hastened without loss of time to say barnabé at the door of ayas the gardener's house was a vine trained to form an arbour whilst two big mulberry trees pruned to the shape of parasols spread their knotty branches around and cast their shade upon the entry marius found philippe seated in the arbour gazing lovingly upon blanche de casalis beside him the young girl already weary was silently regretting what they had done the interview was a painful one full of anguish and shame philippe rose up you blame me he asked holding his hand out to his brother yes i blame you answered marius energetically you have committed a base action pride has led you away and passion has ruined you you have not thought of the evils you will bring on your family and yourself philippe protested you are frightened he said bitterly for myself i did not stop to consider i loved blanche and she returned my love i said to her will you come with me and she came that is the whole story we are neither of us deserving of censure why lie replied marius with greater severity you are not a child and you know very well that your duty was to protect this young lady against herself you should have stayed her on the brink of wrong prevented her accompanying you ah don't talk to me of love i recognize only the love of justice and duty philippe smiled disdainfully and drew blanche to his breast my poor marius said he you are a good fellow but you have never been in love and do not understand its fever this is my defence and he allowed blanche to embrace him as she clung quiveringly to him the poor child felt well enough that her only hope was this man she had given herself away she belonged to him and now she worshipped him almost as a slave lovingly and in fear marius in despair felt that he would do no more good in talking reason to the lovers he determined to follow his own instincts and asked for full details of the unhappy affair philippe quietly answered his questions i have known blanche for nearly eight months he said i met her first at a public festival she was smiling in the crowd and i fancied her smile was meant for me since that day i have loved her and have sought every opportunity of meeting and addressing her haven't you written to her asked marius yes many times where are your letters she has burnt them each time i wrote i bought a bouquet of pine the florist on the cour st louis and slipped my letter in amongst the flowers marguerite the milkwoman used to take blanche the bouquets and did your letters remain unanswered at first yes blanche refused the flowers then she accepted them and finally she ended by answering me i was madly in love i dreamed of marrying her and of loving her for ever marius shrugged his shoulders and drew philippe on one side he there continued the investigation with more harshness in his voice you are either a fool or a liar said he quietly you know very well that m de casalis deputy millionaire all-powerful in marseilles would never have given his niece to philippe caillol poor plebeian and republican in addition to his other drawbacks confess that you have reckoned on the scandal that your elopement will occasion to force blanche's uncle to come to terms well and what then retorted philippe impetuously blanche loves me and i have in no way forced her will she has freely chosen me for her husband yes yes i am aware of all that you have said it too often for me not to know how much of it i should believe 
but you have not considered monsieur de casalis's anger which will fall with terrible force on you and your relations i know the man last night he no doubt exhibited his outraged pride to all marseilles the best thing you can do is to take the young lady back to her home at st joseph no i will not i cannot blanche would never dare return home she had only been at the country house about a week i was in the habit of seeing her twice a day in a little pine wood her uncle knew nothing and it must have been a great shock to him it is impossible for us to go there at present well listen give me the letter for abbe chastanier i will see him and if necessary will go with him to call on m de casalis we must hush up the scandal i have a task to perform the task of repairing the wrong you have done promise me you will not leave this house that you will await here my further instructions i promise you to wait if no danger threatens me marius took philippe's hand and looked him loyally in the face love this child well he said in a deep voice pointing to blanche you will never be able to undo the wrong you have done her he was about to take his leave when mademoiselle de casalis came forward she clasped her hands in supplication stifling her sobs if you see my uncle sir she stammered be sure and tell him that i love him i cannot account for what has happened i would like to remain philippe's wife and to return to my home in his company marius slightly bowed have hope he said and he went off sad and troubled feeling that his words were a lie and that to hope would be madness end of chapters one and two part one chapters three and four of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three there are menials in the church on reaching marseilles marius directed his steps to the church of st victor to which abbe chastanier was attached it is one of the oldest churches in marseilles its dark high and crenulated walls give it the appearance of a fortress the rough people of the port hold it in particular veneration the young fellow found the priest in the sacristy he was a tall old man with a long emaciated face pale as wax his sad eyes had a fixed look of suffering and misery he had just returned from a funeral and was slowly taking off his surplice his history was a short and sad one born of peasant parents and as gentle and innocent as a child he had taken orders to satisfy the pious wish of his mother in becoming a priest he had desired to perform an act of humility of absolute devotion he believed in his simplicity that a minister of god should bury himself in the infiniteness of divine love renounce the ambitions and intrigues of the world and live in the heart of the sanctuary absolving sins with one hand and dispensing charity with the other ah poor abbe how they let him see that the simple-minded are only fit to suffer and remain in obscurity he was soon to learn that ambition is a sacerdotal virtue and that young priests often love god for the sake of the worldly favours that his church distributes he beheld all his comrades of the seminary struggling to the nail he assisted at these internal battles those secret intrigues which turn a diocese into a turbulent little kingdom and as he remained humbly on his knees as he did not seek to please the feminine portion of the congregation as he asked for nothing and appeared piously stupid he was endowed with a miserable living thrown to him as one casts a bone to a dog he remained thus for forty years in a little village situated between aubagne and cassis his church was a kind of barn lime-washed and icily bare in winter when the wind blew in one of the window-panes the interior was chilled for weeks together for the poor priest did not always possess the few coppers necessary to replace the broken glass yet he never complained he lived peacefully amidst his wretchedness and solitude he even experienced great joy in suffering in feeling himself kin to the beggars of his parish he was sixty years old when one of his sisters a workwoman at marseilles became an invalid she wrote to him beseeching him to come to her the old priest therefore begged his bishop to find him a small place in one of the city churches he was kept waiting the fulfilment of his modest request for several months when at length he received a call to st victor there he had to undertake so to say all the roughest work all the labour that brought least renown and least profit 
he prayed over the coffins of the poor and led them to the cemetery he even at times fulfilled the duties of a sacristan it was at this period that he began really to suffer so long as he had remained in his desert he had been able to be simple poor and old at his ease now he felt that his poverty and old age his gentleness and simplicity were looked upon as a crime and his heart was rent when he understood that there could be menials in the church he saw well enough that he was looked upon with derision and scorn he bowed his head still more becoming yet more humble weeping over his faith shaken by the words and deeds of the worldly priests about him fortunately of an evening he had some happy moments he nursed his sister consoling himself in his own way by devoting himself to another he surrounded the poor invalid with a thousand little joys then another pleasure had been vouchsafed him m de casalis who had no faith in young abbes had selected him to be his niece's spiritual adviser the old priest seldom attracted a lady penitent and scarcely ever heard a confession he was moved to tears on the receipt of the deputy's proposal and he questioned he loved blanche as though she had been his own child marius handed him the young girl's letter and watched his face for a trace of the emotions the reading of it was about to cause him he beheld the signs of acute grief yet the priest did not appear to experience that surprise which results from unexpected news and marius concluded that blanche had mentioned in confession her growing affection for philippe you did well to count upon me sir said abbe chastanier to marius but i am very weak and not at all skilful i should have displayed more energy the poor man's head and hands shook with that sad gentle trembling peculiar to old people i am at your disposal he continued how can i assist the unhappy child sir replied marius i am the brother of the young madman who has eloped with mademoiselle de casalis and i have sworn to right the wrong to stifle the scandal will you join with me the young lady's honour is gone if her uncle has already denounced the affair to the authorities go therefore and find him endeavour to calm his anger and tell him his niece shall promptly be restored to him why did you not bring her with you i know how passionate m de casalis can be nothing but certainty will satisfy him it is just that anger which has frightened my brother besides this is no time for reasoning we are overwhelmed with accomplished facts believe me i feel as indignant as you and fully understand how disgraceful my brother's behaviour has been but for pity's sake let us do something very well said the abbe simply i will go wherever you wish they went along the boulevard de la corderie and reached the cour bonaparte where the deputy's town-house was situated m de casalis a prey to terrible anger and despair had returned to marseilles early in the morning following the elopement abbe chastanier stopped marius at the door of the house do not come in said he your visit might be considered an insult let me manage and wait for me here marius walked feverishly up and down the pavement for a good hour he would have preferred to have gone in to have explained matters himself and have asked for pardon in philippe's name whilst the fate of his family was under discussion in that house he had to remain there outside inactive and a prey to all the agony of waiting at length abbe chastanier came out he had been weeping his eyes were red his lips quivering monsieur de cazalis will listen to nothing he said in a troubled voice i found him in a blind rage he has already been to the crown attorney the poor priest did not mention that m de casalis had received him with the bitterest reproaches venting his anger upon him and accusing him in his rage of having given evil counsel to his niece the abbe bent beneath the storm he almost fell on his knees not seeking to defend himself but imploring the deputy to take pity on the others tell me all exclaimed marius in despair it appears the priest replied that the man with whom your brother left his horse assisted m de casalis in his search a complaint was lodged at an early hour this morning and the police have been to ransack your lodging in the rue sainte and your mother's house at st just good heavens good heavens sighed marius 
m de caselli swears that he will crush the whole of your family i vainly endeavoured to bring him to a kindlier frame of mind he talks of having your mother arrested my mother whatever for he makes out that she is an accomplice that she assisted your brother in carrying off mademoiselle blanche what can we do how prove the falsity of such an accusation oh wretched philippe it will be the death of our mother and marius sobbed aloud his face buried in his hands abbe chastanier beheld his fit of despair with tender pity he understood the goodness and probity of the poor lad who wept thus in the open street come my child he said be courageous you are right father exclaimed marius it is courage i need i was weak this morning i should have wrested the young lady from philippe and have taken her back to her uncle an inner voice bade me perform that act of justice and i am punished for not having obeyed its prompting they talked to me of love passion and marriage and i allowed their words to move me they remained a moment silent and then maria said suddenly come with me between us we shall be strong enough to separate them i am willing the abbe replied and without even thinking to take a cab they followed the rue de breteuil the canal quay the napoleon quay and then ascended the canebiere they walked hurriedly along without speaking when they reached the cour st louis the sound of a fresh young voice caused them to turn their heads it was fine the flower girl calling marius josephine cougourdan familiarly known by the pet name of fine was one of the marseilles brunettes small and plump whose refined features have preserved all the delicate purity of their grecian ancestors her round head stood upon slightly drooping shoulders her pale face bore an expression of disdainful scorn beneath her braided black hair passionate energy was visible in her large melancholy eyes which were softened now and again by a smile she was from twenty-two to twenty-four years of age when only fifteen she found herself an orphan with a young brother not more than ten years old dependent upon her she bravely took her mother's place and three days after the funeral whilst still suffering from her great grief she was seated in a kiosk on the cour st louis making up and selling nosegays sobbing the while the little florist soon became the spoilt child of marseilles her youth and grace secured her popularity her flowers it was said had a sweeter smell than those sold elsewhere gallants swarmed around her she sold them her roses violets and carnations but that was all and it is thus that she was able to bring up her brother cadet and apprentice him when eighteen years old to a master stevedore the two young people lived on the place aux Eux in the centre of the labouring class quarter cadet was now a big fellow employed at the docks fine grown handsomer and having arrived at womanhood had the lively gait and careless caressing way of marseillaise women she was acquainted with the cayolles through having sold them flowers and she would speak to them with that tender familiarity which springs from the warm air and gentle language of provence besides which if all must be told philippe had latterly so often bought her roses that she ended by feeling a slight tremor when he approached her the young man who was by instinct an admirer of the sex laughed with her and gazed at her so intently that he made her blush half declaring his love the while and all this simply not to forget the ways of wooing the poor girl who up till then had made short work of would-be lovers fell a victim to this flirtation at night-time she dreamed of philippe and wondered with anguish whatever he could do with all the flowers she sold him when marius approached her he found her high-coloured and troubled she was half hidden by her nosegays and looked adorably fresh beneath the broad lappets of her little lace cap monsieur marius she added hesitatingly is what every one is saying this morning true that your brother has eloped with a young lady who told you that asked marius quickly why every one the rumour is all over the place and as the young man seemed as troubled as herself and stood there without speaking fine added with slight bitterness i was told that monsieur philippe was a flirt his tongue was too soft for his words to be true she was on the point of weeping but was forcing back her tears with painful resignation she then added more gently i can see that you are in trouble if you should need me do not fail to let me know 
marius looked in the face and seemed to guess the agony of her heart you are a brave girl he exclaimed i thank you and will perhaps avail myself of your services he heartily shook her hand as he would have done to a comrade and hastened to rejoin abbe chastanier who was waiting for him at the edge of the pavement we have no time to lose he said the story is spreading all over marseilles we must take a cab night was falling when they reached st barnabé they only found the gardener ayas's wife who was knitting in a low room this woman quietly informed them that the gentleman and young lady had become alarmed and had gone off on foot in the direction of x she added that her son had accompanied them to guide them amongst the hills the last hope was thus dead marius completely overcome returned to marseilles without hearing the encouraging words abbe chastanier addressed to him he was thinking of the fatal consequences of philippe's madness he was rebelling against the misfortunes about to befall his family my child said the priest as he left him i am only a poor man but dispose of me as you will i will go and pray to god for you chapter four how m de casalis avenged his niece's dishonour the lovers had eloped on a wednesday on the following friday all marseilles knew the story the gossips on their doorsteps embellished the adventure with many dramatic details the nobility was indignant whilst the middle-class folk had a hearty laugh m de casalis in his rage had done everything to increase the racket and turn his niece's flight into a frightful scandal clear-sighted people easily accounted for his show of anger m de casalis was a deputy of the opposition and had been returned at marseilles by a majority composed of a few liberals some priests and members of the aristocracy devoted to the cause of legitimacy bearing one of the most ancient names of provence bowing humbly before all powerful mother church he had experienced considerable repugnance in flattering the liberals and receiving their votes in his eyes they were merely varlets servants fit only to be whipped in the public streets his indomitable pride suffered at the thought of lowering itself to their level yet he had been obliged to bow before them the liberals noised abroad the services they were rendering and for a time a pretence was made of disdaining their assistance but when they talked of intervening in the election by naming one of their own party as a candidate m de casalis was forced by circumstances to bury his hatred in the depths of his heart promising himself his revenge on some future occasion then the most shameless jobbery was resorted to the clergy took the field votes were secured right and left thanks to innumerable civilities and promises with the result that m de casalis was elected and here was philippe Cayolle one of the leaders of the liberal party fallen into his hands at last he would be able to gratify his hatred on the person of one of the louts who had bargained with him for his return to the chamber he should be made to pay for all his relatives should be ruined and plunged into despair and as for him he should be thrown into prison precipitated from the height of his dream of love on to the straw of a dungeon what a little nobody had dared to win the love of the niece of a casalis he had led her away with him and now they were both roving along the roads attending the hedge school of love it was a scandal to be made much of an ordinary person would perhaps have preferred to hush it up to conceal the deplorable adventure as far as possible but a casalis deputy and millionaire was possessed of sufficient influence and pride to proclaim the shame of a relative abroad without a blush what mattered a young girl's honour all the world might know that blanche de casalis had eloped with philippe Cayolle, but no one should be able to say that she was his wife that she had degraded herself by marrying a poor devil without a handle to his name pride required that the child should remain dishonoured and that her dishonour should be posted on the walls of marseilles m de casalis had bills placarded in all the squares of the city promising ten thousand francs reward to whosoever would bring him his niece and her seducer bound hand and foot when one loses a pure-bred dog it is also usual to advertise for it among the upper classes the scandal spread still more noisily m de casalis decimated his rage everywhere he availed himself of the influence of his friends of the clergy and nobility as guardian of blanche who was an orphan and as a trustee of her fortune he urged on the authorities in their search and drew up the indictment of the accused 
it might be said that he took pains to procure the greatest possible publicity for the gratis show about to begin one of the first measures he resorted to was to secure the arrest of philippe cayolle's mother when the crown attorney presented himself she replied to all questions that she did not know her son's whereabouts her confusion her anguish her mother's fears which made her hesitate were no doubt considered so many proofs of complicity she was sent to prison more as a hostage and possibly in the hope that her son would surrender himself in order to secure her release when marius heard of his mother's arrest he almost went mad he knew she was in delicate health and pictured her with terror shut up in a bare and icy cold cell she would die there tortured by all the pangs of suffering and despair marius was also suspected at the outset but his firm answers and the bail that his employer the shipowner martelli offered on his behalf saved him from imprisonment he wanted to remain free in order to work for the salvation of his family little by little his upright mind was able to properly weigh the facts at first he had been overwhelmed by philippe's guilt he had seen only the irreparable wrong his brother had done and he had humbled himself desiring solely to calm blanche's uncle and give him every reparation possible but in face of the deputy's rigour of the scandal he was raising the young man had a revulsion of feeling he had seen the fugitives and knew that blanche was voluntarily accompanying philippe and he was indignant at hearing the latter accused of abduction hard words flew around him his brother was called a scoundrel a villain and his mother did not come off much better in consequence his love of truth prompted him to defend the lovers to take the part of the fugitives even against the authorities besides which the deputy's noisy accusations sickened him he felt that true grief is dumb and that an affair in which a young girl's honour is at stake should not be ventilated in public and he felt all this not because he wished to see his brother escape chastisement but because his delicacy was wounded by all this publicity given to a child's shame moreover he knew the meaning of the deputy's rage by striking philippe he was striking far more the republican than the abductor marius was thus in his turn overcome with anger he was insulted through his family his mother cast into prison his brother tracked like a wild beast his dearest affections dragged in the mud they were the victims of bad faith and passion at this he held up his head again the guilt was not all on the side of the ambitious lover who had eloped with a wealthy young lady it was equally the portion of him who was stirring up marseilles and who intended using all his power to satisfy his pride since the authorities had undertaken to punish the first marius swore that sooner or later he would punish the second and that in the meantime he would upset his plans and endeavour to counterbalance the influence his wealth and birth gave him from this moment marius displayed febrile energy he devoted himself entirely to the preservation of his mother and brother unfortunately he was unable to learn what had become of philippe two days after the flight he had received a letter in which the fugitive implored him to send him a thousand francs to defray the expenses of his journey the letter was dated from lambesque philippe had there found a few days hospitality in the house of m de Giroux, an old friend of the family m de Giroux, who was the son of a former member of the parliament of aix was born in the midst of revolution at his first breath he had inhaled the burning atmosphere of eighty nine and his blood had always preserved a little of the revolutionary fever he felt uncomfortable in his mansion on the cour at aix in his eyes the nobility of the town seemed possessed of such inordinate pride such deplorable inertness that he judged it severely and preferred to live at a distance from it his upright mind his love of logic had helped him to accept the new order of things and he willingly held out his hand to the people and accommodated himself to the tendencies of modern society at one time he had thought of founding a factory and of exchanging his title of count for that of manufacturer considering that nowadays the only nobility is the nobility of talent and labour and as he preferred living alone away from his equals he stayed the greater part of the year on an estate he owned near the little town of lambesque it was there that he had harboured the fugitives marius was overwhelmed by philippe's request his savings did not amount to more than six hundred francs he bestirred himself and during two days endeavoured to borrow the remainder of the amount one morning when he was beginning to despair fine called upon him he had confided his trouble to the young woman the day before 
she had been for ever on his footsteps since philippe's flight and constantly asking for news of his brother being apparently most anxious to know whether the young lady was still with him fine laid five hundred francs on a table there she said with a blush you can return it to me later on it's some money i put aside to purchase my brother's discharge if he was drawn in the conscription marius would not accept it you're making me waste my time resumed fine with charming abruptness i must hurry back to my flowers but if you don't mind i'll call here every morning for news and she hastened away marius sent the thousand francs then he heard nothing further but passed a whole fortnight in complete ignorance of the march of events he knew philippe was being relentlessly hunted down and that was all he would not believe the grotesque or frightful stories that were current with the public he had enough with his own fears without being frightened at the gossip of the town he had never in his life before suffered so much his anxiety nearly drove him mad the least sound frightened him he was for ever on the alert as though expecting some bad news at any moment he heard that philippe had gone to toulon and had almost been arrested there the fugitives it was said had then returned to aix there all trace of them was lost had they attempted to cross the frontier had they remained in hiding among the hills no one seemed to know marius was all the more anxious because he had been obliged to neglect his work at the shipowner martelli's if he had not been fixed to his desk by duty he would have hastened to philippe's assistance and would have personally occupied himself with his safety but he dared not leave the business where his services were required m martelli showed him quite a paternal sympathy a widower for several years past and living with one of his sisters who was twenty-three years of age he treated marius like a son on the morrow of the scandal raised by m de casalis the shipowner called the young man into his private office ah my friend he exclaimed this is a very unpleasant matter your brother is done for we shall never be strong enough to save him from the terrible consequences of his folly m martelli belonged to the liberal party and was noted for the southern violence of his opinions he had already had some spars with m de casalis and therefore knew his man his strict probity his immense fortune placed him beyond all attack but he possessed the haughtiness of his liberalism and took a sort of pride in never making use of his power he advised marius to keep quiet and await events he would render him all his assistance once the struggle was started marius consumed by his fever was about to ask him for a leave of absence when fine all in tears appeared one morning before him the gentleman has been arrested she exclaimed between her sobs they found him with the young lady in a cottage in the trois bon dieu quarter about a league from aix and as marius greatly agitated rushed downstairs to make inquiries which only too fully bore out the truth of fine statement she still in tears smiled and said in a low voice at any rate the young lady is no longer with him End of chapters three and four part one chapters five and six of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five blanche journeys six leagues on foot and sees a procession pass by blanche and philippe left the gardener's house at dusk at about half-past seven o'clock during the day they had noticed gendarmes on the road they were assured that they would be arrested that evening and fright drove them from this their first retreat philippe put on a peasant's blouse whilst blanche borrowed a workwoman's dress from the gardener's wife a red cotton gown with a flowery pattern and a black apron she put a yellow check fichu round her breast and a big coarse straw hat on her head victor the son of the house a lad of fifteen accompanied them to show them the way across the fields to the x road the warm night air was full of murmurs a hot breath rose from the earth counteracting the fresh breeze which was wafted now and again from the mediterranean a bright light like the reflection of a fire still illumined the west the rest of the sky was of a violet blue gradually growing paler in colour while the stars appeared one by one in the night similar to the flickering lights of a distant town the fugitives hastened along with bowed heads and without exchanging a word they were in a hurry to find themselves amidst the solitude of the hills 
so long as they were crossing the outskirts of marseilles they met a few passers-by whom they eyed with distrust at last the open country spread out before them and the only human beings they encountered were now and again some grave shepherds standing at the edge of the path watching their flocks and their flight continued in the gloom and the emotional silence of the serene night vague sounds floated around them pebbles rolled beneath their feet with a noise that filled them with uneasiness the sleeping countryside extended like a black mass in the monotony of the darkness blanche affrighted clung to philippe hastening her little footsteps in order to keep up with him she heaved deep sighs as she recalled the peacefulness of her nights at home then they reached the hills with the deep ravines which had to be crossed around marseilles the roads are soft and easy but out in the country one meets those rocky ridges which cut up the whole centre of provence into narrow sterile valleys uncultivated plains stony slopes with here and there some sorry tufts of thyme and lavender now extended before the fugitives in all their desolate mournfulness the paths wound up and down the sides of the hills fallen rock now and again blocked the way beneath the bluish serenity of the heavens one could have fancied it a sea of pebbles an ocean of stones stricken with eternal immobility in the midst of a hurricane victor leading the way softly whistled a provencal air as he jumped from rock to rock with the agility of a chamois he had grown up amid this desert and was acquainted with its innermost recesses blanche and philippe followed him laboriously the young man was supporting the girl whose feet were cut by the sharp stones on the way she did not complain and whenever her lover gazed inquiringly into her face in the transparent darkness she smiled to him with sad sweetness they had just passed septem when the young girl worn out sank to the ground the moon slowly rising in the heavens lit up her pale face bathed in tears philippe bent over her in great distress you are crying he exclaimed you are in pain my poor darling child ah it was cowardly of me to keep you with me was it not do not say that philippe replied blanche i am weeping because i am a miserable girl see i can scarcely walk we should have done better to have fallen on our knees before my uncle and have implored him with clasped hands she regained her feet with an effort and they continued their journey over the arid hills it was far different from the gay and foolish escapade of a couple of lovers it was a dismal flight full of anxiety the flight of a guilty couple silent and quaking with fear they traversed the gardan district struggling during five hours against the obstacles of the way at last they decided to descend to the high road leading to aix and there they were able to proceed more freely the dust however nearly blinded them when they reached the top of the arc hill they dismissed victor blanche had covered six leagues among the rocks on foot in less than six hours she sat down on a stone seat at the gate of the town and declared that she could not proceed any further philippe who feared to be arrested if he remained at aix went in search of a vehicle he came across a woman driving a light cart who agreed to give him and blanche a lift as far as lambesque whither she was bound in spite of the jolting blanche fell into a sound sleep and did not wake up until they were nearing their destination this sleep calmed the fever of her blood she felt soothed and stronger the lovers alighted from the vehicle just as day was breaking a fresh and radiant dawn which filled them with hope the terrors of the night had vanished the fugitives had forgotten the septem rocks and were walking side by side in the damp grass intoxicated with their youth and love not finding m de girus of whom philippe had intended asking hospitality they went to an inn where they were at last able to enjoy a day of peace on the morrow philippe saw m de girus who had returned he told him the whole story and asked his advice the deuce exclaimed the old nobleman your matter is serious you know my friend you're but a clodhopper a hundred years ago m de casalis would have hanged you for daring to touch his niece nowadays he can only have you cast in prison and you may be sure he won't omit to do so but what had i better do now what had you better do why restore the young lady to her uncle and make for the frontier as fast as you can you know very well that i shall never do that very well then just wait quietly until you're arrested i've no other advice to give you 
so there beneath a friendly abruptness m de Giroux hid the kindest heart in the world as philippe confused by the curtness of his reception was about to take his departure he called him back and taking his hand continued with slight bitterness my duty would be to have you arrested i belong to that nobility you have just insulted listen i have somewhere on the other side of lambesque a little unoccupied house of which i will give you the key go and hide yourselves there but don't tell me you're going to do so if you do i'll send the gendarmes after you it was thus the lovers remained nearly a week at lambesque they lived in retirement amid a peacefulness broken at times by sudden alarms philippe had received a thousand francs marius had sent him blanche was becoming quite a little housekeeper and they ate out of the same plate with delight this new life was like a dream to the young girl at times however she would wonder why she had gone off with philippe she would then experience a revulsion of feeling and wish to return to her uncle but she never dared say so it was then the time of the feast of corpus christi one afternoon as blanche was looking out of the window she saw a procession pass by she knelt down and joined her hands and fancied she could see herself dressed in white amongst the singers her heart was bursting that night philippe received an anonymous letter warning him that he would be arrested on the morrow he thought he recognized m de Girousse's handwriting the flight was resumed more difficult and painful chapter six the hunt after the lovers then ensued a regular rout a race without truce or repose an ever-recurring panic driven right and left by their fright perpetually fancying they could hear the sound of horses hoofs behind them passing their nights hurrying along the highways and their days trembling in the filthy rooms of country inns the fugitives crossed and recrossed the whole of provence going before them and retracing their footsteps not knowing where to find an unknown retreat hidden on the confines of some desert they left lambesque one terribly stormy night and went in the direction of avignon they had hired a little cart and the wind nearly blinded their horse blanche was shivering in her thin cotton dress to complete their wretchedness they thought they could see from a distance at one of the gates of the town some gendarmes examining the faces of the passers-by thoroughly frightened they retraced their steps and returned to lambesque through which they only passed arrived at aix they did not dare stay there and resolved to reach the frontier at no matter what cost there they would procure themselves a passport and be in safety philippe who knew a chemist at toulon decided to pay a visit to that town he expected that his friend would be able to assist him in his flight the chemist a big merry fellow named jourdan received them very well he hid them in his own room and promised to at once try and obtain them a passport jourdan was gone out when two gendarmes called blanche nearly fainted away white as a ghost and seated in a corner she was stifling her sobs philippe in a choking voice asked the gendarmes what they wanted are you monsieur jourdan one of them inquired with a roughness which forebode nothing good no replied the young man monsieur jourdan is out but will soon be back very well said the gendarme curtly and he seated himself heavily the poor lovers scarcely dared look at each other they felt fit to faint away in the presence of these men who had no doubt come after them their anguish lasted a good half hour at length jourdan returned he paled at the sight of the gendarmes and answered their questions with the greatest confusion you must come with us said one of the men what for he asked what am i accused of you are charged with having cheated at cards last night in a club you will be able to give your explanations when before the magistrate a shudder passed through jourdan's frame he was quite dazed and accompanied the gendarmes with the docility of a child they went off without even perceiving the terror of the lovers jourdan's affair made a great sensation at toulon at the time but no one knew of the painful drama which had been enacted at the chemist's the day of his arrest this event took all the courage out of philippe he understood that he was not strong enough to evade the police who were on his track besides he had now no longer any hope of obtaining a passport and would therefore be unable to cross the frontier moreover he saw that blanche's strength was giving away he therefore determined to return towards marseilles and wait in the neighbourhood of the city until m de cassalis's anger was partly appeased like all those who have no longer any ground for hope 
he had at times ridiculous visions of pardon and happiness philippe had a relation at aix named isnard who kept a draper's shop not knowing where to obtain hospitality the fugitives returned to aix to ask isnard for the key of one of his cottages a fatality pursued them the draper was away and they were obliged to hide themselves in an old house on the cour sextius belonging to a cousin of m de Girousse's farmer this woman would not at first receive them fearing she might be called to account later on for her hospitality she only yielded before philippe's promises to procure her son's exemption from military service the young man was no doubt in a hopeful frame of mind he could already see himself a deputy's nephew and was disposing freely of his uncle's great influence that evening isnard came to the lovers and handed them the key of a cottage he owned in the puricard plain he had two others one at tholonais and the other in the district of trois bon dieu the keys of these were hidden under certain great stones which he described to them he advised them not to remain two nights running beneath the same roof and promised to do his best to put the police off their track they started off and took the road which passes beside the hospital isnard's cottage was situated to the right of Priricard, between the village and the road leading to venel it was one of those ugly little buildings formed of lime-washed stones without mortar and enlivened by a roof of red tiles it contained but one room little better than a dirty stable straw refuse littered the ground and great cobwebs hung from the ceiling they had fortunately brought a rug with them they gathered the litter into a corner and spread the rug over the heap this formed their couch amid the acrid exhalations of the dampness surrounding them on the morrow they passed the day in a hole in a dried-up watercourse called the touloubre then towards evening they gained the venel road and reached the Lonnais by a roundabout way in order to avoid passing through aix it was eleven o'clock when they arrived at the draper's cottage situated below the jesuit oratory this cottage was rather better it had two rooms a kitchen and a parlour which latter contained a fold-up bedstead the walls were covered with caricatures cut out of the charivari and strings of onions hung from the whitewashed beams the lovers could almost fancy themselves in a palace in the morning their fright returned they climbed the hill and remained till night-time in the recesses of the infernet in those days the precipices of jaumegarde still possessed all their sinister horror the zola canal had not then pierced the mountain and strollers did not often venture into that dismal abyss of reddish rocks blanche and philippe enjoyed profound peacefulness in the midst of this desert they rested long beside a clear and murmuring spring which trickled from a gigantic mass of rock at nightfall returned the cruel question of shelter blanche could now scarcely walk her wounded feet bled upon the sharp and pointed stones philippe understood he could not take her much farther he supported her and they slowly ascended to the level ground overlooking the infernet it is an extensive uncultivated plain vast fields of pebbles waste land broken up here and there by disused quarries nothing looks so strangely wild as this broad landscape with its bare horizon dotted here and there with a dark and stunted vegetation the rocks looking like distorted limbs pierce above the barren earth the plain having the appearance of a humpback seems to have been stricken with death in the midst of the convulsions of a terrible agony philippe hoped to find some hole some cavern he had the good luck to discover a shanty one of those shelters in which sportsmen hide themselves while awaiting the flight of birds of passage he did not hesitate to force in the door and seated blanche upon a little bench he felt beneath his hand then he went and gathered a quantity of thyme the plain is covered with this humble grey plant the strong perfume of which rises from every hill of provence he carried the thyme into the shelter and spread it in the form of a mattress over which he laid the rug the bed was ready and the fugitives kissed each other good night upon this miserable couch philippe was unable to sleep the strong smell of the thyme upon which he was lying affected his brain he dreamt in spite of his wakefulness that m de casalis had received him affectionately and that he had been elected deputy in his uncle's stead now and again he could hear blanche's mournful sighs as she slumbered beside him agitated and feverish the young girl had come to consider her flight some nightmare full of bitter pleasures during the day she was rendered stupid by fatigue she smiled sadly and never complained her inexperience had caused her to agree to the flight and her weak character prevented her proposing to return 
she belonged body and soul to this man who carried her along all she wished was to have to walk less she continued to believe that her uncle would consent to her marriage when his temper had cooled the fugitives left their bed of time at sunrise their clothes were becoming terribly torn and their shoes were nearly worn out in the coolness of the morning amid the wild perfumes of this solitude they forgot their wretchedness for a time and declared laughingly that they were frightfully hungry so philippe told blanche to go back to the hut and hurried off to tolonet in search of food it took him a good half hour when he returned he found the girl in a state of terror she assured him she had seen some wolves prowling about the table was laid on a large flat stone and they were like a couple of gypsy lovers breakfasting in the open air after breakfast they made for the centre of the plain and remained there all day these were some of their happiest hours but when the twilight fell fear again seized them they dreaded to pass another night amidst all that solitude the pure warm air of the hills had filled them with gentler thoughts and hopes you are tired my poor child asked philippe oh yes she replied listen we must perform one more journey let us go as far as isnard's cottage in the trois bon dieu district and remain there until your uncle forgives us or has me arrested my uncle will forgive us i dare not think it in any case i will no longer fly you have need of rest come let us walk slowly they crossed the plain leaving the infernes behind them and passing the chateau of st marc which they could see on an eminence on their right they reached their destination at the end of an hour isnard's cottage was on the slope of the hill which stretches to the left of the vauvenargues road after one has passed the repentance glen it was a small one-storied house the ground floor consisted of a single room containing a rickety table and three old rush-bottomed chairs a ladder led to the upper room a kind of loft almost entirely bare and containing merely a wretched mattress on a heap of hay isnard had considerately placed a sheet at the foot of the mattress philippe's intention was to go on the morrow to aix and procure information as to m de cazalis's intentions towards him he felt that he would be unable to hide himself any longer he went to rest in an almost peaceful frame of mind calmed by blanche's kind words as she judged events with all a young girl's hopefulness it was now twenty days that the fugitives had been running about the country and during this time the gendarmes had been scouring the neighbourhood following on their track sometimes losing it but always getting set right again by some slight circumstance the deputy's anger had only increased with the delay his pride was irritated by each fresh obstacle at lambesque the gendarmes came a few hours too late the arrival of the fugitives at toulon was not known until the morrow of their return to aix everywhere they escaped as though by a miracle the deputy ended by accusing the police of being lukewarm he was informed at last that the lovers were in the neighbourhood of aix and that they were on the point of being arrested he hastened there to assist in the search the woman of the cour sexus who had given them hospitality for a few hours was seized with terror to avoid being accused of complicity she told all she knew and said that they were probably hidden in one of isnard's cottages isnard who was questioned quietly denied everything he declared that he had not seen his relative for several months past this was happening at the very time philippe and blanche were entering the cottage in the trois bon dieu district the draper was unable to warn the lovers during the night at five o'clock the next morning a police commissary called on him and informed him that he was going to search his house and three cottages m de cazalis remained at aix saying he was afraid he would kill his niece's abductor if he ever met him face to face the officers sent to search the cottage at Piricard found the nest empty isnard obligingly offered to lead two gendarmes to his place at tolonet feeling certain that they would waste their time the police commissary also accompanied by two gendarmes went to the trois bon dieu he took a locksmith with him isnard having vaguely stated that the key of the cottage was hidden under a stone on the right of the door it was about six o'clock when the commissary arrived there everything was closed and not a sound came from inside he went forward and hammering on the door with his fist exclaimed in a loud voice open in the name of the law echo alone answered nothing stirred 
after waiting a few minutes the commissary turned towards the locksmith saying pick the lock the locksmith selected his tools and the grating of the iron could soon be heard in the silence the shutter of a window was then violently thrown back and philippe cayolle disdainful and angry his neck and arms bare appeared in the bright light of the rising sun what do you want he asked leaning on the window-sill the first blow struck by the commissary had awoke the fugitives seated on the edge of the mattress still half asleep they listened anxiously to the voices without the words in the name of the law that cry which rings so terribly in the ears of the guilty struck the young man full in the chest he jumped up quivering bewildered not knowing what to do the young girl huddled up in the sheet her eyes still heavy with sleep was shedding tears of shame and despair philippe understood that all was over and that he had only to surrender himself but a dull feeling of revolt rose within him so his dreams were dead he would never be blanche's husband he had carried off an heiress to be himself cast into jail instead of the happy existence he had dreamed of he ended by gaining a prison cell then a cowardly thought passed through his mind it occurred to him to leave the girl there and fly in the direction of vauvenargue in the defiles of st victoire perhaps he could escape by a window at the back of the cottage he bent over blanche and in a low hesitating voice told her of his project the young girl half stifled by her sobs did not understand nor even hear him he saw with anguish that she was not in a state to assist his flight at this moment he heard the sound of the workman picking the lock the poignant drama that had just been enacted in that bare room had lasted at most a minute he felt himself lost and his chafed pride restored his courage had he been armed he would have defended himself but conscious that he was no abductor blanche having accompanied him voluntarily he felt that he had nothing to be ashamed of so he angrily pushed back the shutter and asked what was wanted open the door ordered the police commissary we will tell you afterwards what we want philippe went down and opened the door are you monsieur philippe cayolle resumed the commissary yes replied the young man energetically then i arrest you on the charge of abduction you have carried off a young girl under sixteen years of age who is no doubt hidden here with you philippe smiled and said mademoiselle blanche de casalis is upstairs and can tell you if i used any violence towards her i don't know what you mean by talking of abduction i was about to go this very day to monsieur de casalis and ask him for his niece's hand in marriage blanche pale and shivering had just come down the ladder she had dressed herself hastily mademoiselle said the commissary i have orders to take you to your uncle who is awaiting you at aix he is in great grief i am deeply sorry for having displeased my uncle replied blanche with some firmness but you must not accuse m cayolle whom i accompanied of my own free will and deeply affected on the point of again bursting into sobs she turned towards the young man and continued have hope philippe i love you and will beseech my uncle to be good to us our separation will only last a few days philippe looked at her sadly and shook his head you are a weak and timid child he replied slowly then he added in a harsher tone remember only that you belong to me if you forsake me you will find me ever in your life the recollection of my kisses will never cease scorching your lips and that will be your punishment she was weeping love me well as i love you he resumed more gently the police commissary placed blanche in a carriage he had had brought to the spot and took her back to aix whilst the two gendarmes marched philippe off and placed him in the prison of the town End of chapters five and six part one chapters seven and eight of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven blanche denies her love the news of the arrest did not reach marseilles until the following day and caused quite a sensation m de casalis was observed driving along the canebiere in the afternoon accompanied by his niece the gossips had their fill 
every one spoke of the deputy's triumphant attitude and of blanche's shame and embarrassment m de cazalis was capable of dragging his niece throughout marseilles to show the people she had returned to his protection and that no woman of his race would marry beneath her marius informed by fine was out and about all day the common talk of the town confirmed the tidings and he was able to pick up all the details of the arrest in a few hours the event had become legendary and the shopkeepers the idlers and loafers related it as though it had been the marvellous tale of something that had happened a century before the young man tired of hearing these cock-and-bull stories went to his office his head aching and his brain incapable of deciding what course to pursue unfortunately m martelli would be away until the following evening and marius felt the need of doing something at once he would have liked to have immediately taken some steps that would have reassured him as to his brother's fate his first alarm had now however partly subsided he reflected that after all his brother could not be accused of abduction and that blanche would be there to defend him he ended by naively imagining that it was his duty to call upon m de cazalis and ask him for his niece's hand in philippe's name on the following morning he dressed himself in black and was going out when fine came as usual the poor girl turned quite pale when marius told her what he was about to do will you permit me to accompany you she asked in a beseeching tone of voice i will wait outside to learn the answer of the young lady and her uncle she followed marius and when they arrived at the cour bonaparte the young man walked firmly to the deputy's house and sent up his name m de cazalis's blind passion had now subsided he held his vengeance he would be able to prove his might by crushing one of those republicans whom he detested now his sole desire was to taste the joy of playing with his prey so he ordered that m marius cayolle should be admitted he expected tears earnest supplications the young man found him standing up haughtily in the centre of a vast saloon he advanced towards him and without giving him time to speak said calmly and politely i have the honour to ask you sir in the name of my brother m philippe cayol for the hand of your niece mademoiselle blanche de cazalis the deputy was thunderstruck marius's request seemed to him so absurdly extravagant that it failed to anger him he stepped back looking the young man straight in the face and answered with a disdainful laugh you must be mad sir i know that you are an industrious and honest fellow and it is for that reason that i do not have you put out your brother is a scoundrel a knave who shall be punished as he deserves what do you want with me on hearing his brother insulted marius felt a great desire to strike the noble personage as one of the rabble would have done he restrained himself however and continued in a voice that was beginning to tremble with emotion i have already told you sir i am here to offer mademoiselle de cazalis the only reparation possible that is to say marriage the wrong that has been done her can thus be effaced we are above any wrong exclaimed the deputy with contempt the shame for a cazalis is not that she has had anything to do with a philippe Cayolle her shame would be to ally herself to such people as you such people as we have other ideas as regards honour however i will not dwell upon it my duty alone prompted me to offer you the reparation you refuse permit me merely to add that your niece would no doubt accept this offer if i had the honour of making it to her in person you think so said m de cazalis sarcastically he rang the bell and requested the servant to ask his niece to come to him at once blanche entered pale-faced and red-eyed looking worn out by her two powerful emotions she shuddered on beholding marius mademoiselle said her uncle coldly this gentleman has asked for your hand on behalf of the scoundrel whose name i will not pronounce in your presence tell the gentleman what you told me yesterday blanche reeled she dared not look at marius her eyes fixed upon her uncle her whole frame trembling she murmured in a weak and hesitating voice i told you i had been carried off by force and that i would do all in my power to secure the punishment of the odious attempt made upon me these words were uttered like a lesson learnt beforehand blanche denied her love m de cazalis had not lost his time as soon as his niece was in his power he influenced her with all the weight of his obstinacy and pride 
she alone could secure his ultimate success it was necessary that she should lie and stifle her feelings that she should become a compliant and passive instrument in his hands during four hours he kept her under the spell of his sharp cold words he was not so foolish as to give vent to his rage he spoke with crushing haughtiness recalling the ancient origin of his race displaying his wealth and power he skilfully showed her on the one hand the picture of a vulgar and ridiculous marriage and on the other the noble joys of a rich and great alliance he attacked the young girl through her vanity tired her out broke her spirit dulled her intellect and rendered her such as he desired tractable and inert blanche emerged from this long interview this continuous martyrdom utterly vanquished perhaps beneath the sting of her uncle's overpowering words her patrician blood had at length revolted at the memory of philippe's vulgar love perhaps her childhood dreams were called upon as the deputy descanted on luxurious costumes worldly elegance and honours of all kinds moreover her head was too bad her heart too sore for her to resist that terrible will every sentence m de casalis uttered struck her crushed her filled her with painful anxiety she no longer felt the power of having a will of her own she had loved and accompanied philippe through weakness now she was turning against him also through weakness she was ever the same timid being she accepted everything and promised everything she longed to escape from the stifling weight with which her uncle's words were crushing her on hearing her make her strange declaration marius stood amazed and terrified he remembered the young girl's attitude when at ayes the gardener's he could recall her clinging to philippe's neck loving and confiding ah mademoiselle he exclaimed bitterly the odious attempt you speak of did not seem to fill you with such abhorrence the day you beseeched me to implore your uncle's pardon and consent have you reflected that your falsehood will cause the ruin of the man you perhaps still love and who should be your husband blanche now erect her lips tightly drawn together was looking vaguely in front of her i do not know what you mean she stammered i have told no falsehood i yielded to force that man took advantage of me and my uncle will avenge the honour of our family marius drew himself up dignified anger increased his short stature and his feeling of justice and truth made his thin face appear handsome he looked around him contemptuously and said slowly and yet i am in the home of the casalis of the descendants of that illustrious family which is the glory of provence i had no idea that falsehood dwelt in this abode i never expected to find calumny and cowardice lodging here side by side oh you shall hear me to the end i intend to cast my lackey's dignity in the teeth of my unworthy superiors turning towards the deputy he continued as he pointed to the trembling girl that child is innocent and i forgive her weakness but you sir you are a clever man you safeguard the honour of your women by making them untruthful and faint-hearted were you now to offer me the hand of mademoiselle blanche de casalis for my brother i should refuse it for i have never lied i have never been guilty of a base action and i should blush to be allied to such people as you m de casalis bent beneath the young man's rage at the first insult he had summoned a big valet who stood at the open door as he signed to him to put marius into the street the latter resumed with terrible energy i swear i will shout out murder if this man moves a foot let me pass one day sir i may be able to fling in your face before all the world the truce i have just told you in this room and he walked out slowly and firmly he no longer thought of philippe's guilt his brother had become in his eyes a victim whom he was determined to save and avenge at no matter what cost in this upright nature the slightest untruth or injustice raised a tempest already the scandal stirred up by m de casalis at the time of the elopement had caused him to take the fugitive's part now that blanche lied and the deputy resorted to calumny he longed to be all-powerful in order to proclaim the truth from the housetops pine a prey to anxiety was waiting for him outside well asked the young woman as soon as she caught sight of him well he replied those people are miserable liars and vain fools 
fine drew a deep breath whilst a blush spread over her cheeks so she resumed m philippe is not to marry the young lady the young lady said marius smiling bitterly pretends that philippe is a scoundrel who carried her off by force my brother is lost fine did not understand she bowed her head wondering how the young lady could treat her lover as a scoundrel and she thought how happy she would have been had philippe carried her off even by force marius's anger delighted her the marriage would never take place your brother is lost she murmured in a soft wheedling voice oh i will save him or rather we will save him together chapter eight the iron pot against the earthen ewer when marius told m martelli that evening of the interview he had had with m de casalis the shipowner said as he shook his head i do not know what advice to give you my friend i do not wish to drive you to despair but you will be conquered take my word for it your duty is to enter upon the struggle and i will assist you to the best of my ability yet we had better admit to each other that we are weak and unarmed in the presence of an adversary who has the clergy and nobility behind him marseilles and aix have little love for the july monarchy and these two towns are both wholly devoted to a deputy of the opposition which is waging such a war against m thiers they will assist m de casalis in his revenge i am alluding to the bigwigs the common people would help us if they were able to help any one the best thing would be to win over some influential member of the clergy to our cause do you know any priest who is in favour with our bishop marius replied that he only knew abbe chastanier a poor old man who certainly possessed no influence never mind go and see him said the shipowner the townspeople cannot be of any use to us the nobility would show us the door if we asked their assistance so there is only the church left that is where we must apply begin your campaign i shall be busy on my side also on the following morning marius went to st victor where abbe chastanier received him with a sort of timid embarrassment don't ask me to do anything he exclaimed at the first words the young man uttered it is known that i have already occupied myself with this affair and i have had to endure some grave reproaches i told you before i am only a poor man i can only pray for you marius was affected by the old man's humble attitude and was about to withdraw when the priest detained him and said in a low voice listen there is a man here a bedonadei who might be useful to you it is said that he is on the best of terms with his lordship he is a foreign priest an italian i think who has won everybody's good will in a few months he stopped speaking hesitating and seeming to be inquiring of himself the worthy man was thinking that he was about to compromise himself terribly but he could not resist the joy of doing a kindness would you like me to take you to him he asked suddenly marius who had perceived a slight hesitation sought to decline but the old man insisted forgetting entirely his personal tranquillity listening only to the promptings of his heart come he resumed abbe donadei lives only a short distance off on the boulevard de la corderie after a few minutes walk abbe chastanier stopped at a little one-storied house one of those discreet dwellings which have a vague air of the confessional about them here we are said he to marius an old woman servant opened the door and conducted them to a small apartment with dark hangings resembling some austere boudoir abbe donadei received them with easy grace his pale face with delicate features bore a slightly cunning expression and did not show the least surprise he drew some chairs forward in a coaxing manner his body half bent a slight smile about his lips doing the honours of his study like a lady does those of her drawing-room he wore a long black robe loose at the waist but this severe costume covered coquettish manners his delicate white hands appeared quite small as they issued from the ample sleeves and his clean-shaven face had a soft fresh complexion beneath the curly locks of his chestnut-coloured hair he looked about thirty years of age when he had seated himself in an armchair he listened with smiling gravity to what marius had to say he made him repeat all the spicier details of blanche's elopement and the story seemed to interest him immensely abbe donadei was born at rome and had an uncle who was cardinal one fine day his uncle suddenly packed him off to france without anybody knowing exactly why 
on his arrival the handsome abbe found himself obliged to enter the ex seminary as a teacher of living languages such an humble position so humiliated him that he fell ill the cardinal relented and recommended his nephew to the bishop of marseilles his ambition satisfied donna dei quickly recovered he joined the clergy of st victor and as abbe chastanier had naively said he succeeded in winning everybody's good will in a few months his caressing italian nature his soft pink face turned him into a cherub in the eyes of the demure lady devotees of the parish he was especially successful in the pulpit his slight foreign accent gave a strange charm to his sermons and when he spread out his arms he knew how to cause his hands to tremble with an emotion which filled the eyes of his congregation with tears like most italians he was a born intriguer he used and abused his uncle's recommendation to the bishop of marseilles and soon became a power an occult power working underground and digging pitfalls in front of those persons he desired to remove from his path joining a religious club then all-powerful at marseilles he succeeded in imposing his will on his colleagues thanks to his suppleness his perpetual smile and humility and in becoming the leader of a party then he interested himself in every event had a finger in every pie it was he who secured m de cazalis's election as deputy and he was awaiting a fitting opportunity to claim the reward of his services his plan was to work for the success of wealthy people later on when he had merited their gratitude he intended to make use of them in building up his own fortune he questioned marius courteously by the attention he paid him and his sympathetic manner he seemed fully disposed to assist him in his work of deliverance the young man allowed himself to be taken in by this pleasant amiable behaviour and unburdened himself relating his plans and owning that the clergy alone could save his brother finally he begged his kind offices with his lordship the bishop abbe donadet rose and said in a tone of austere raillery my cloth sir forbids my mixing myself up in this deplorable and scandalous affair the enemies of the church are only too fond of accusing the clergy of interfering in worldly affairs i can only beseech the almighty to pardon your brother marius in dismay had also risen he understood that he had just been duped by donadet he sought however to disguise his feelings i thank you he replied prayers are indeed the sweetest of alms for the unfortunate pray that we may be granted the justice of our fellow-men he turned towards the door followed by abbe chastanier with bowed head donna day had affected to ignore the old priest when they were on the point of leaving the room the handsome abbe recovering all his graceful sprightliness detained marius a moment you are employed at monsieur martelli's i think he asked yes sir the young man answered with surprise he is a very honourable man i know however that he is not one of our friends nevertheless i esteem him greatly his sister mademoiselle claire whose spiritual director i have the honour of being is one of our best parishioners and as marius looked at him finding nothing to say donna day added with a slight blush she is a charming person most exemplarily pious he bowed with an exquisite politeness and then gently closed the door outside on the pavement abbe chastanier and marius looked at each other and the young man could not help shrugging his shoulders the old priest was quite confused at having seen one of god's ministers play a part like an actor he turned to his companion and said hesitatingly my friend you must not blame the almighty if his ministers are not always what they should be the young man we have just been with is only guilty of ambition he continued a long time in this strain finding excuses for donna day marius watched him affected by his goodness and in spite of himself he compared this poor old man to the powerful abbe whose smiles were law in the diocese then he reflected that the church did not love all her sons equally but like most mothers spoilt the rosy-cheeked ones and neglected the tender spirits who did good by stealth the two visitors were moving off when a carriage drew up at the door of the closed discreet little house and marius beheld m de cazalis alight the deputy hastily entered abbe donadet's abode look father exclaimed the young man i feel certain that priest's cloth will not prevent his abetting m de cazalis in his vengeance he was tempted to return to that home of hypocrisy 
but calming himself he thanked abbe chastanier and went off he thought with despair that the last loophole of safety the one in possession of the upper clergy was closing before him on the morrow m martelli told him the result of a visit he had paid to the chief notary of marseilles m douglas a pious man who in less than eight years had become quite a power through his wealthy clients and his great charity his name was loved and respected people spoke admiringly of the virtues of this upright worker who led a frugal life unlimited confidence was placed in his honesty and the activity of his intelligence m martelli had availed himself of his services when investing some money he thought that if douglas would use his influence on marius's behalf the latter would secure some of the clergy to his side he called on the notary and asked for his assistance douglas who appeared very much occupied muttered an evasive reply saying that he was overwhelmed with business and quite unable to struggle against m de casalis i did not persist said m martelli to marius i thought i understood that your adversary had been beforehand with you there yet i am surprised that such an upright man as m douglas should have allowed his hands to be tied i am afraid now my poor friend that the game is indeed up for a whole month marius went about marseilles seeking to win over a few influential persons he was everywhere received coldly with railing politeness m martelli was not more fortunate the deputy had enlisted the sympathies of the whole nobility and clergy the middle classes the shopkeepers were laughing in their sleeves unwilling to move owing to their great fear of compromising themselves as for the common people they sang songs about m de casalis and his niece this being all they could do on philippe caillol's behalf days passed by and the preparations for the trial went on apace marius was still as much alone as on the first day in preparing his brother's defence against the uncle's hatred and the niece's obedient falsehoods there was only fine whose angry speeches merely won over the work-girl's warm sympathy to philippe's cause one morning marius learnt that the act of accusation against his brother and the gardener ayes had been drawn up the former being accused of abduction and the latter with being an accomplice in the crime madame cayolle had been released for want of proof marius hurried off to embrace his mother the poor woman had suffered greatly during her incarceration her feeble health was seriously compromised a few days after leaving the prison she gently expired in her son's arms and he sobbing vowed to avenge her death the funeral was the occasion for a popular demonstration philippe's mother was conveyed to the st charles cemetery followed by a long procession of women of the people who did not hesitate to revile m de casalis openly they were even strongly inclined after the funeral to go and throw stones at the windows of the deputy's house alone in his little lodging in the rue sainte marius when all was over felt himself deserted in the world and wept bitterly his tears relieved him he saw the road he had to follow traced out clearly before him the misfortunes which were overwhelming him increased in his breast the love of truth and hatred of injustice he felt that all his life must henceforth be devoted to a holy cause he could no longer act at marseilles the scene of the drama having changed future events would be occurring at aix where the trial was to be held he desired to be on the spot in order to follow the different phases of the affair and take advantage of any incidents which might arise he asked his employer for a month's leave of absence which the latter immediately granted the day of his departure he found fine waiting at the coach office i am going to aix with you she said quietly but that would be madness he exclaimed you cannot afford to give your time thus who will attend to your flowers during your absence oh one of my friends a girl who lives on the same floor as i do at the house on the place aux Eux. i said to myself i can be useful to them so i put on my best dress and here i am i thank you very much marius replied simply in an agitated voice End of chapters seven and eight